Good evening. Welcome back to Bible Baptist Church for our evening service. So glad that you have joined us. A few things to update you on before we move right along. First of all, I want to give out some personal thank yous uh, to some folks who have been so helpful here uh, with the services. I want to thank Joshua Glodan. does a great job filming and preparing uh, the video side of our services, and Brother Daniel Solario, uh, Brother Samuel Jacobeck, he helped out uh, last week, but primarily it's been Brother Daniel Solario up there. I'm looking up there at him right now. I want to thank him up in the uh, recording, the sound recording part, my wife on the piano, her diligence, all the singers that we have had. I just wanted to take about 30 seconds to thank all of them for their work, and a big thank you to Brother Counts, for coming in this uh, morning service and speaking to us for a few minutes. If you missed that, go back and catch this morning service and you can see his encouraging word to you from this morning. And then at the close of the service tonight, we have a video from you. We were supposed to have the Lavelle family with us. They've been scheduled for months, but because we're meeting in this way, I've had him send a video to the church. We've supported them in Belgium, he said on the video, for 24 years. And I know you'll want to watch his video. That'll be right at the close of the message this evening. Please remember when it comes to the offering, which right now we would normally receive if we were gathered together, you can go to the website, you can go to that Push Pay app, and you can also mail that in to the church address and uh, you can get that in however you can. We know that you want to remain faithful. Let's begin our service in a word of prayer, please. Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of this morning's service. And now, Father, for tonight, may you work, may you move in our lives in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all take our Bibles right now and open them to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4, and once you find the chapter, look at verse number 31. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday evening regarding the Lord's church. And as you're finding your place, I am so thankful for this church family. I've not just been on the staff, I've been a member here 
uh, for over 23 years and I've raised my family here and I'm so thankful for you, thankful for our church family, thankful this morning. Our former pastor, Brother Counts, had an opportunity to speak to us for a couple minutes there in the service and glad for that and I'm glad for the legacy we have together as a church family, not just my dad and Brother Counts, but Brother Wood and so many others who have served in so many different capacities throughout the year and remain faithful. A church in the truest sense, and we're speaking on the church tonight here in Acts chapter 40, uh, chapter 4, excuse me, in verse number 31, it says, and when they had prayed, notice that, when they had prayed, would you remember with me the message last week, the power of a praying church? Now we move on. The place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Father, I pray that you'll take these few minutes that we have together in your word, and how, Father, it just seems like a few in such a busy, changing time. May it be special to us to gather together in a unique way as a church family to hear the preaching of your word, the teaching of your word. And so, Father, I pray that you would take these minutes that we have and apply them directly to our heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Alexander the Great conquered the world. It was his goal to conquer the world. He died at the age of 33. It is believed he died at such a young age because he accomplished his life goal in his early 30s, died at a young age. Most people believe it's due to the fact that he lost his passion. He gave his life to licentiousness and gave his life to many things a person normally wouldn't, but he had no ambition. He had lost his passion because he thought he had achieved it all. Tonight, I want to speak to us, not on the power of a praying church, but tonight on the power of a passionate church. Passion is key to your life, and I believe that the secret of personal, spiritual, Christian passion is very simple. It's not something that's complex. When somebody is passionate, they're aimed at one thing. Ball players, we miss sports. I, even as someone who's sports-minded, I like athletics. I think we kind of begin to realize maybe how little of little importance sports really is to our lives at a time like this. But an athlete will give themselves. And this last week, I thought of our Olympic athletes, not just here in America, but around the world. The Olympics were planned for this year. They've been postponed. Those athletes had a passion to make the Olympic Games and to win a medal. And now that's been delayed. Their, their passion will be prolonged. I'm sure there was a discouragement that they had. A businessman can have passion for what he does, but he's single-minded in that passion. A teacher would have a passion to make a difference to students. I believe that a preacher, a pastor, ought to have a personal passion for God that would bring itself through to those that would hear the Word of God. But for the Christian, the secret of passion One is no secret. Two, it's very simple. God lays it out for us. It's this truth found in the book of Ephesians that everything we do, we do as unto the Lord and not to men. If you and I were to focus our lives and say, I give myself every waking moment of every day fully to the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be a passion about us that would keep us going through the good days, through the mundane days, through the bad days. Right now, I think we'd all agree that we're, we're in difficult times. I have a growing list on my iPad. Many of you I've spoken to personally. It's growing every day of people I'm talking to that your hours have been cut. Jobs have been lost. Some have had to pick up extra work. I've spoken to some that have had to file for unemployment where for a few weeks ago you gave no thought to that. This is difficult times. But it's in the difficult and the routine days. You see, often we look for something to reignite our passion in a big moment. Something comes from the clouds, a a mountaintop experience, and those days do come. But most of our days are found in a daily struggle or just found in a daily routine. Somebody asked me a few few years ago, they said, Pastor, said, how do I really grow 
in my life. And I said, the honest truth is, it's very simple. You're single-minded in a devotion to God, and you learn to live every day exactly how you know you're supposed to live. So the secret to passion is very simple, but it can be lost so quickly. I want you to see some things from this early church here in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 4 tonight, really just three things tonight that I want to give to you about a passionate church. Would you look with me again at verse number 31? Look with me in the Bible. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now on that, we, we pause there in the reading of the text earlier And we pause, it says, when they had prayed. There's a reason in this series that we're doing while we're apart that we're preaching on the church. Because if I were to tell you this, my heart is with you. You have no idea how much I miss seeing you. You have no idea how much it burdens me as a pastor. You have the idea in your own life as a a Christian. But as a pastor to stand, and I'll just open my heart to you for a moment. As a pastor to stand before an empty congregation I'll tell you, that's tough. Why? Because I love you, and I long to see you. I long for the day that we gather back together, and so many of you, and thank you, so many of you have texted me and messaged me. I thank you for that. You've emailed me. You've called me. I get those regularly. May I say I thank you for every one of them. If you'd like to contact me, I try to be an easy person to find. You can contact me anytime. And I thank you. So many of you have encouraged me, and I know you feel the same way. You can't wait for the day. And I want to preach to you on the church, because one one concern that I have, God's going to take care of His church, but one concern that I have as a pastor is that through this time, even though it may be short, and I pray that it is, that we as a church family, we don't begin to scatter, but we grow stronger together. Keep calling one another, encouraging one another, emailing one another. Stay on these videos and services and watch and encourage. I encourage you to comment in them and tell how God is blessing you and helping you that we would grow stronger together. I'm so glad, even as a church family, even as as members together, it was informed. I don't know exactly who. I don't ask for that. But I was told by the finance office, said so many people are staying faithful. You know what that's an indication of? To me, it's it's not about the money. God takes care of his church. It's about people saying, I'm going to stay faithful. And through this, I've been told that there are people who have begun to give over the last couple of weeks because they see the need and they see the value of what we're doing together as a church and how God is speaking to your heart. And I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your witness that as a church, we continue to grow stronger together by the grace of God, that we don't go this way, but that we grow this way and we grow stronger together bonded. I enjoy doing those videos I'll talk about it in just a moment. I enjoy watching the others make videos, the missionary stories. I enjoy reading the comments about that. I love this church. But if there's one thing I would say for this church is don't lose our passion. Don't lose our enthusiasm for the things of God. Three things in this. It says, when they had prayed, that's where it all begins. Power of a praying church. But now the power of passion in the church. It says, there the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. We're going to come to that, whether this week or sometime in the near future. We're going to come to that, but notice it says, and they spake the word of God with boldness. These were people, and please note this, these were people who did not look at their circumstances. You say, what were their circumstances? Well, they were being persecuted. They were being sought after. They had the religious leaders breathing down their neck, We saw last week how they came together, they reported that, and they went to the Lord and said, Oh God, we need you. They had their burden. They did not look at their circumstances and see problems. They looked at people and they saw need. Notice with me, the church was burdened. Now, I'm afraid we've looked at that word burdened and we begin to sing that old spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And that can be a burden. 
But a burden shouldn't bring us down. A burden should draw us to the Lord. Our theme this year of onward, looking unto Jesus, that as we go forward, a burden will bring us down if we're focused on ourselves, but focused on Christ, a burden will help us to see the need. And that burden helped them see the need of their own. Look at verse, me at verse number 32. And the multitude of them that believed, this is that early church, that early local assembly, they were of one heart and of one soul. They were one. In our church, as I alluded to a moment ago, the, the needs that go around, so many people saying, Pastor, if somebody needs someone to stand in line for them at the grocery store, if they need a delivery, I don't have to speak to them. They don't even have to know it was me. I'll just, I'll put that bag on the, on the porch. I'll set it on their doorknob and they can get it. They don't even know it, need to know it was me. If there's somebody who needs assistance, you just let me know. You know what that is? That's a church that says, we're one. The videos that go up, whether it's a little object lesson that I do, I was kind of kidding around with my family the other day. If you saw it, you can look it up. But on there, I had a blindfold on. It was talking about obedience. And obedience gives direction and protection and uh, correction. And I put it on there. When I saw the video, I told my family, it's supposed to be a video on obedience. It looks like pastor's hostage video out there. I'm blindfolded speaking to a camera. But I enjoy doing that. I did an experiment where something blew up and I gave an object lesson about uncertainty for boys and girls and Brother Ted doing a great job with the teens and Brother Daniel Solario with the missionary stories that we're doing and other things we're putting out. Why? We come together even by a video to express that we are one. But I ask you this, are we different? Sure we are. I would hope that a time like this would help us to see that maybe most of those differences, if not all of those differences that we have with another brother and sister in Christ, we would lay those aside. I would hope that a time like this of uncertainty and difficulty for many and something that, quite honestly, in a, in a natural human sense, might cause some fear into some people. And I remind you, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But it's given you, maybe a word is just some, some hesitancy in your life that maybe we look at that other person that we've had a problem with, that other person that we've had a struggle with, maybe right now or in the past, and say, you know, maybe there's some things in life that are bigger, and we'll lay it aside because we come together and we are one. But not only were they one, they were committed to one another. There's a man down in verse number 34. It says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. They together said, That brother has a need, and I'll give to them. But then there's one shining example. It says there, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. Barnabas wasn't even known by his name. Barnabas wasn't his name. We have people that we meet that they go by some kind of a nickname. In the world, their celebrities go by a nickname. There was a man in the church who went by a nickname. His name was Joseph. They called him Barnabas, son of consolation. We today would say the son of exhortation, the son of of encouragement. And I'm sure it was in what he said. I'm certain of that. I'm sure he spoke a good word. But think with me. It was Barnabas who brought brought Saul, who became the apostle Paul, to the early church and said, I can vouch for him. It was in his action that he committed himself. Here you'll see. Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid at the apostles' feet. Why? To be used of others in their time of need. His sacrifice demonstrated his commitment. They were sacrificial one to the other. And May we as a church family, you see, remember something. We don't know how, but this time period will pass. May we keep that same spirit. What would it do in our church family if we kept the same passion and drive to check on some of our older folks in the church family, to check on some of those who are potentially high risk now, 
you know, that means that they probably have some health problems. Wouldn't it be something, wouldn't it demonstrate that passion if we, if we continued that in the days that came? Even when things with this settle down, that there'd be a, a small army of people that say, bless God, I'm going to continue contacting people regularly. I'm going to continue putting out emails and texts of encouragement that we understand we're all in this together, but many who would make sacrifices and who would give that others would have the needs of their own, but the needs of others. From outside, and I'm standing in the four walls of the sanctuary, we've learned very well in the last couple of weeks that a church is more than a building. Church is not a building. Church is the people of God. We assemble separately, but we're in this together. But outside of a church's walls, so to speak, there are needs of those around us in the community. There is a reason why last week I was burdened for us to put up and take care of a Facebook ad, to put out a little bit of of finance, not very much. It didn't take much at all, less than than ordering some tracks. But we put it out, just put out a minute-long video to say we don't want to be a church that's just a building in the community to you. We want to be a church family that's a part of your community and if we can serve you. And we've heard from some folks this week. Why? Because we want to make a difference because there's one mission. When they prayed, the Spirit of God came upon them. They didn't roll up and down the aisles. They didn't say that they did all sorts of different things. It says when the Spirit of God came upon them after they prayed, they had one mission, to preach the gospel and to make Jesus known. It says that with all boldness, they spake the word. I like this, that word boldness. It means to be outspoken. That We don't hide in a a shadow or on the side. And we'll come out when someone expresses some interest in Jesus. No, we tell others about Jesus. It means there to be blunt. In my life, I'm always checking in my life. Maybe you're the same way with me. If I'm not careful, the words that I say can sometimes to a brother or sister or to a young person or uh, to another brother in Christ can come across a little too blunt. And I've worked in the last few years of my life. God's convicted me to say what I say to others Maybe, maybe kind of round off the edges a little bit. But when it comes to telling others of Jesus Christ, there's no room for rounding off the edges. We must tell others that without Jesus, we would all likewise perish. And so everyone who would hear the truth of the Word of God must make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ to be outspoken and truly be blunt about the need of telling others of Jesus Christ. In an uncertain world, this world needs people who are certain and they are burdened with the needs, not just of their own, though that's vital, but needs of those who are around them to reach them for Christ. A passionate church is burdened, but a passionate church is fervent. Look with me in verse 33. It says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all. When somebody is fervent in Christ, it means that they go at it. They go at it diligently. They go at it consistently. You'll notice something here. It says that they had great power. It was a power not of themselves. It is the power of the Spirit of God. It is the power of the resurrection that builds a fervency in the life of a Christian. It's hard to believe. It doesn't seem possible. But two weeks from today is Easter Sunday, or as many would call it, Resurrection Sunday. Whatever label you give to it, it's the day set aside specifically to celebrate a risen Savior. It is the identifying mark of the Christian. We don't minimize that Jesus rose. We extol the fact. We lift up the fact. We tell of the fact. We live with the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. But truly in our lives, the resurrection isn't a one-year event. It's day by day. We meet on a Sunday, and I encourage you to meet together with us at the appointed time, if at all possible. Why? Because we are celebrating a risen Savior, but 
realize something. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The same power that rose, raised Jesus up from the grave is available to the Christian today to live in, to walk in, to abide by, to go through difficulty in. It is resurrection power in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ because he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he said, go ye. How? In his power. It is the power of Jesus Christ that resurrection power is available to the child of God today by the working of the power of the Spirit of God as we yield ourselves to Him, as we give ourselves to Him, as we walk in Him. There is power of the resurrection, power of the Spirit of God. But He also says in verse 33 that great grace was upon them all. It is the exceeding Favor of God. Child of God, think with me right now. Great grace bring upon you a demonstration of the favor of God. If you cannot see that in your Christian life in this hour and in this time in our country and in our world, I don't know when you'll ever see it. If you, I just be open with you, Christian. If you are just continuing to walk through the Christian life just as you always did, I think there's some things you ought to check up on because it's time like these that draw us to a place that we stop wishing and start living in the grace of God. The grace of God makes a difference. We don't look, if, Christian, if this has not driven us to the Bible, if this has not driven us to prayer, if this has not driven us to a passion, a burden for the lost, I don't know whatever will. Maybe it's time that we got on our knees before God and say, God, renew a passion within me because a passion isn't just burdened. It isn't just fervent. A passion at church is dependent. We read it. We've mentioned it. We'll preach on it again in the very near future. It says in verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Dependent. They were controlled by the Spirit. But we naturally like our independence and in ways, that's a good thing, to grow up and be dependent. My children will one day grow, and they'll not live in our house anymore. I'm going to buy them houses right next door. Wish I could. But they'll be on their own. They'll grow on their own. They'll have families of their own. That's a certain level of independence that's good. But did you know we can get to too great of an independence as a Christian? where we think we can do it all without Christ and without others? Because in true, in true reality, we're not independent. We are interdependent, as we've spoken of already. We're in this together passionately. But truly, we are not just to be independent. We're not just interdependent. We are to be dependent, totally dependent on the work of the Lord. And see... The more I lean, just as I lean, I think I'll still be in camera view. But even as I lean upon this pulpit right now, I can tell you, I'm leaning all my weight. I've even picked up one leg. I'm leaning it all here. If the pulpit weren't here and I couldn't depend on it, I'd hit the floor. But I know I can depend on this. Christian, I ask you something. Church family, I ask us all something. Will we lean on the Lord? Will we lean on the Spirit of God at a time like this in an even greater way than I'm leaning on the pulpit? So much so, so that if the Lord, if the Spirit of God didn't grant His favor, we'd fall flat. That's how the church has to operate. By faith, complete and total dependence on the Spirit of God so that if God weren't in it, we'd lay flat on our faces, not saying, well, we can do it this way and we can devise a plan and I'm all for planning and we can have a program and I'm all for programs. But if we ever come to the place that we as a church, we as individuals don't lean on the Lord in complete and utter dependence so that if He were not in it, we would fall flat. We will never see truly what God God can do. That's true in a church. That's true in my life. And that's true in your life. And that's how God has called us to live. And the person who utterly depends on God is passionate. And you say, Pastor, how do I have that? How do I have that kind of dependence, that kind of a burden, 
that kind of a desire to be fervent. Three things. You lost your passion? Three things. Number one, remember. If you're a child of God, you remember a day. If you don't have that passion today, you remember a day when you did. And you probably remember what tripped you up. Paul wrote this, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You remember, maybe even in some lives, the moment that stopped you. You remember the person in your life that you allowed to stop you. You remember the moment that your adversary, the devil, brought something into your life that tripped you up and you've not been the same. But do you remember when it was and how sweet it was? Remember? Secondly, I would tell you, repent. Repent. What does repent mean? We don't like that word. It simply means a decision, a choice of the mind to turn and to head in a different direction. See, I can remember all I want, but if I don't go back, I'll never get there. I remember and I repent. I have a willingness and a hunger and a desire to turn. And then the third word is like unto it. Remember, repent, return. Go back. Get back into the Word of God as you once did. Get back into your prayer life as you once did. When when the church doors are open and we're gathering together, get back to being faithful. I think some of us have learned how much we need to gather together by having to miss one another, but be faithful in the meantime to these online services. But get back to where you once were in your fellowship with believers. Get back to where you once were in your service. Get back to where you once were in your witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, remember what it was and what drew you away. Return, repent, get back in your mind and say, I choose by a decision of my heart and mind to go back and then return. Walk in that place. And as a Christian, you'll see by the work of the Spirit of God, a renewed passion in your life. And Christians, I desire church family And I love using that phrase at a time that we're apart. Let's get back. Let's get back. Let's get back to a renewed passion because there's power in the passionate church. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this time in your word. And Father, I pray that our passion for you, for the church, for the lost, for one another would be renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for being here for the message tonight. This won't conclude the service right now. As soon as I'm done, we're going to have a video, as I said, from Brother Lavelle. You check that out. I am so glad that you are with us. Be back with us again Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Hey, Brother Counts. Thanks for letting us be there with you this evening uh, in this virtual type setting. Uh, The Bible Baptist Church family has been supporting us for almost 24 years now. So each soul that's saved, that's fruit to your account. Well, what makes Belgium unique is that it's not a third world country. It's not even a second world country. It is a first world country that has first world problems. Uh, We have running water, we have electricity. We don't have to paddle upstream in a canoe to get to a village. For that, we're very thankful. Uh, Even the internet speed in Belgium is faster than here in America. And so Belgium, the the people don't need food, they don't need clothes, they don't need shoes. What they need is Jesus. And if you were to look at them uh, out on the street, you'd look at them and you'd say, they look like Americans because they live in nice homes, they drive nice cars, they go out to eat a lot, and they're in debt. So sounds like America to me. Jesus actually talked a lot about Belgians, not the country or the people per se, but to the people group to which they belong, and that is wealthy. You see, Belgium is the 10th wealthiest nation in the world. So then the question becomes, why do we even bother to send the gospel to a rich country? And part of that is a a perception problem. Uh, When I grew up, I grew up as a pastor's kid, and uh, I saw more than my fair share of videos and slides, and we'd see these pictures of kids, and they'd be starving kids with bloated stomachs and emaciated faces and sunken eyes, and we'd look at them and go, wow, they need Jesus. And that's true. But somehow, poverty has been equated with the need for the gospel. But yet there are people on the other side of the world, people who are not poor, 
and they need the same Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus said that the poor will always be with you in John chapter number 12. So no matter how much money we throw at the problem, uh, it's always going to be there. But Jesus said something else that really gets ignored. He said it'd be the rich people of this world that would have a hard time getting into the kingdom of God because their stuff gets in the way. And he even gave us a mental illustration. He said that it would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it would be for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So we're in the middle of our second church plant. And this second church plant looks a lot like the first. It started as a Bible study in our living room, but this time it's different in that we provide a meal beforehand. Now, if you know anything about the city that we live in, the city named Bruges, it's a tourist city, which means that it's open 365 days a year. So that means that the shopkeepers would never ever be able to enter the door of a church on a Sunday morning because their business is open. So what works for them? Saturday night. And so we're, we've created this environment where we have this meal and Bible study. They come directly from work on Saturday night. We sit around the table and uh, during dessert, we share God's word. This is a picture of our very first meal and Bible study combo. And there's seven people that came and uh, they're still active, they're still part of it. But now two years later, it looks a little bit different let me show you what we have to do every Saturday evening to get ready to transform our living room for Bible study. So we have 18 to 20 people that come every single week and over a third of them are not saved. So we're super thankful for that. Our living room is only 12 by 15. So it takes a little bit of creativity to get everybody in there. But this around the table format is what's working. We're gonna keep it that for as long as we can. And so people are coming to Christ because of your faithfulness and your support. And we are exceptionally grateful.